So we have about 24 people right now, 23. <laughs> So I think I'll start now, or should we wait for a few more people? Yeah, I think you should start. Okay. So hello, everyone, and welcome to day four of our webinar series for in preparation for World Rivers Day. And um, so yesterday we had a really interesting session. It was connecting rivers and fish, and we had some really, really fascinating discussions on small fish, large fish like goonch, massive masirs, origin of rivers, fish ladders, so you name it. And all in all, it was a great discussion. So if any of you guys missed it and would like to watch it, it's still uh, up on our YouTube channel, Learn Indian Freshwater Ecosystem, so you can check that out. And so today we have a fascinating session, uh, River Reptiles and Sandy Shores. That was purely my, my doing. I'm a big fan of alliteration. And it's also about uh, topics that are quite close to my heart. So gharias, turtles, aquatic reptiles and such. And also topics that, you know, as wildlife biologists or ecologists, we don't really focus enough on as much as we should. So like sand and river flows, erosion, deposition rates, which Devyani today is going to be talking about. So I'm personally really interested to hear her talk. So uh, without wasting any more time, I'd like to quickly introduce our first speaker, Jailabdin. So as he mentioned earlier, we were um, docents together for a very short time, probably four or five years back. And um, he is currently project coordinator for MCBT's Gharial Ecology Project and is doing his PhD from Bharti Dasan University. Through his research, he has learned about the signature signals in male gharials, communication between rival males, and adult hatching communication post-hatch. So Jailabdin is also a ZSL Edge Fellow and is currently working in Chambal. So on over to you, uh, Jailabdin, and if you could briefly also give us a bit about how has it been working as a ZSL Edge Fellow? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Anjit. Thank you for the intro. Uh, I'm uh, actually working on uh, Gaya's behavior for past five plus years. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, as an H fellow, uh, I'm really glad uh, to extend the project's uh, uh, activities throughout the sanctuary. Uh, so actually, uh, the real ecology project has been uh, in Chambal. Uh, for past 10 plus years and uh, we have been concentrating on the downstream of chamber so far uh, but from 2017 onwards uh, we have been concentrating on the upstream of chamber also uh, so uh, I think on moving on to the topic uh, which I'm going to talk uh, today uh, so uh, basically uh, let me share my screen um, yeah. what do you yeah <laughs> Thank you. 
जब ये स्टार्ट स्क्रीन शेयर जेफ्री लैंग एंडेकर uh so uh, way, way back in 2007 and 8 uh, in the winter there were like uh, mass die off of gharials happened uh, in chambal uh, most of them most of the people who have been uh, uh, working in gharials know about it uh, so basically the radio telemetry uh, became a tool for knowing what is happening in the system why the animals are dying and eventually uh, that thing has been started and as an behavioral study and eventually turned as a behavioral study uh so uh, the main thing which we actually uh, uh, do with radio tagging is uh, the tagging and tracking of gharials is not only say about that particular one animal uh, but as everyone knows gharials live in colonies so that particular tracking of one animal which tells about the whole uh, group of animals which is actually related to it. Uh, oh, so so bitter man What Hello. Hello. Yeah, I think you're okay yeah, to continue Jay, we, now. Yeah, Jay, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, that one animal will actually tell you about the group which is actually related to related with. Uh, so that's uh, how the radio telemetry actually answered us many questions like uh, what the gharials usually do. Uh, so they do seasonal movements, uh, and especially females, they travel like 200 plus kilometers uh, in the river. Uh, and uh, these movements are actually seasonal based, uh, depending depending upon which season on what they actually require, which I will tell you in the upcoming slides. And uh, also, our extensive behavioral observation actually told us about the allo parenting of gharials. Uh, so the allo parenting uh, for the viewer for the participants uh, just a brief about allo parenting so allo parenting is uh, uh, an unique behavior which actually uh, uh, happens in primates uh, where uh, one particular uh, adult will take care of uh, young ones which is not really blood related with the adult uh, so uh, everybody actually know about the famous pictures of gharials with the thousands of hatchlings next to the male Uh, so those hatchlings are actually not his own hatchlings. Uh, so that might be uh, uh, a question which is being answered by the DNA studies which we are being collaborating with CCMB uh, in Karan, which is going on. Uh, and uh, as Anuja mentioned, I have been uh, doing my PhD in communications of gharials, especially on acoustic and pheromone aspects. Uh, in acoustic aspects, uh, male gharials do do produce popping sounds. Uh, which are unique, like uh, uh, you can identify uh, each individual animals in the system using those acoustic signals. Uh, similar uh, in a way how you can uh, identify tigers using the stripes. Uh, you can use uh, you can identify uh, each adult by using the uh, acoustic signals. Uh, and uh, moreover, we are implementing aerial survey technologies like uh, uh, for the nesting surveys and for the population surveys. Uh, which actually refine the old boat survey technology uh, and gives us a more idea about like what is the actual uh, quantification of those numbers uh, and all. Uh, so let's come back to the point: uh, why gharials and rivers? What is the correlation between gharials and rivers? Uh, so if you see uh, this particular picture, like uh, every conservationist dream is actually wants to witness something like this, like. Uh, Evening shoreline, uh, gharials are basking, and behind there are skimmers, yeah, Indian skimmers also. Uh, so uh, why uh, really rivers are important for gharials? Uh, because gharials are actually the top predators in the river ecology. Uh, gharials and muggers are the top predators predators in the river ecology. So everybody knows about the food chain. So if you remove one any one of the participants from the food chain, it will actually collapse the whole ecosystem. Uh, so uh, 
uh, the other question which can raise is over here, why can't we actually see gharias in all the river systems, like how we actually seeing muggers in everywhere, right? Uh, so uh, basically, gharials really need a certain uh, uh, characterization habitat uh, for the survey. Uh, so people who already work with gharials, they know like uh, when they think about a gharial habitat, they usually say about like they need high sand banks with deep pools. Uh, but uh, on our behavioral uh, studies, actually, uh, there are so many factors which actually uh, affect gharials. Uh, and uh, they need a different kind of habitat for each and every season, uh, like uh, during courtship and uh, uh, breeding season, they really need a, a flat sandbar like uh, how I showed in the picture over here. Uh, so, and they need kind of a back channel water where they can actually uh, go for the courtship. Uh, but during the nesting time, they really need a high sand bank. Uh, which are like around 70 degree in an angle, so they can climb and nest over there. And during monsoons, they need uh, 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 big river confluences and stream confluences where actually uh, uh, the water force will uh, bring back many fishes. And uh, that's what gharials need also, like they need many fishes. And the interesting fact is uh, uh, everybody thinks that uh, all the repellents will eat for the throughout the year, but not like that. Reptiles metabolism is not made like that. So usually uh, gharials especially, they uh, feed their 90% of their food during the monsoon only, uh, during this high waters and uh, in the river consequences. Uh, so all these specific uh, particular habitats are actually uh, not occur in the same place in the river system. So that's where these seasonal movements actually help them. So uh, they need like a free flow river uh, where they can, without any uh, barriers like uh, dams or any reservoirs, uh, which they can use for an extensive uh, movement. Uh, so uh, that's how chambal is really important uh, over here. Uh, so in this slide, actually, uh, uh, I'm showing you on the left hand side. Uh, so this is actually a study which I, uh, I just want to mention before I go into the slide. This is a study which uh, did by Dr. Jeffrey Lang uh, for the IUCN uh, red, list, red list assessment. Uh, so in 2007, uh, the earlier assessment actually assessed gharials under critically endangered by the numbers. So basically there were uh, 250, less than 250 gharials in 2007. So they became critically endangered. But uh, when they reassessed gharials, it's not the scenario. So now in Chambal itself, we are actually getting like 400 plus nests every year, uh, which means that there are 400 plus females. Uh, and if you calculate about males, there are like around 500 uh, adults uh, in Chambal itself. Uh, so, uh, but now how gharials are actually critically endangered. So uh, the left hand side actually shows uh, the geolocation points uh, on the left hand side is actually the historical distribution of gharials. Uh, so what Jeff did was uh, he actually referred to uh, many British gazettes and uh, personal references and personal diaries of the colonels and majors uh, who have been ruled in India you know, through East India Company. Uh, so he referred on those uh, places where they actually mentioned uh, anywhere they mentioned that uh, we spotted a slender snouted crocodilian in this part. So uh, those kind of reference point he uh, made it together. Uh, to find uh, on how many places the gharials actually existed within the century. Uh, and on the right hand side is the current distribution of gharials. So according to this, actually uh, the uh, distribution of gharials has been shrinking shrink drastically, uh, like uh, around the 90 percentage within the century. So under this, actually gharials have become critically endangered. Uh, so this is where actually uh, Chambal is uh, really important because Chambal is the only river sanctuary in the Indi in the whole India, and uh, uh, Chambal is the place uh, where you can actually uh, have we are actually having 80 to 85 percentage of world uh, wild gharial population. So uh, uh, this is actually because Chambal uh, within the sanctuary limit there are no any dams, there are no any barriers or anything. So this free flow is not only actually helps for uh, uh, gharials, but uh, it actually helps for the other river uh, uh, species like turtles and uh, dolphins and uh, skimmers. 
because when you actually have something uh, blocking within uh, between a river uh, like a dam uh, it actually uh, affects the river's free flow uh, like kind of a sedimentation and everything uh, so uh, if you see the whole indus system the major uh, reason why the whole indus system garials went extinct is the damming reason uh, so uh in the last point of my story which i just want to finish it over here uh is uh, the whole system is under threat right now because of the anthropogenic uh, uh, uh and anthropogenic effect which is been happening all over the place uh because we need more and more uh resources so we are extracting the natural resources in an uncertain way uh so these are actually uh leading to uh the river and habitat degrad degradation uh, so it's really important to save these kind of habitats not only uh, i'm i'm studying garials but not only for garials but for uh, turtles and uh, sandy beach birds like skimmers uh, terns gangetic dolphins there are many uh, many species like that uh, which has been understudied uh, still in chambal also uh, and uh, yeah so that's it uh, on uh, uh, my topic uh i'd like to thank for this opportunity to anuja and as well as i thank uh, my team members who have been working with me uh for the past uh a few years and uh, uh the main interesting thing i just want to share you is uh, like the reason covid situation is affected many people and their field work but uh, uh, we have been very least affected during the covid situation also that's really because of uh, we have this extensive support from the field as well as we have this extensive support from our donors who have been uh, uh, not with our funding and all so i'd like to thank the, uh, like like to thank them also giving the opportunity thank you anuja yeah thank thanks jay so uh, you briefly showed one picture where you know which were like kind of drone shots so you know you are also kind of are you monitoring sandbanks with those drones and uh, just sort of to you know move get a flow into devyani stock also could you just talk a little bit about how um, you know these sandbanks are so integral to garial populations and maintaining these sandbanks you know for future generations of garials yeah so uh... see uh, basically when we, when we actually implemented the drone survey we actually implemented uh, on the aspect of uh, calculating the uh, uh, population as well as for the nesting and all but uh, the data which we are actually getting out from the drones with the technology what we are having nowadays uh, thanks for the technology uh, like you can actually calculate the altitude of the sandbar and you can mm -hmm. actually can uh, calculate an uh, area where the gadiels mm -hmm. are preferring and those kind of stuff actually uh, can helpful in assessing uh, why garials are actually preferring and how garials are preferring sand bank so those kind of studies is actually really necessary to assess okay. these uh, sand bar because uh, the pressure right now on uh, using this uh, natural resources is like we cannot really avoid like basically uh, on an water extraction project we cannot really avoid because uh, on the management side they will be saying that uh, no we really need water for the people like there is no water for the people what we are going to do say how we are going to save these animals so that's how they ask us uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we need to have some kind of threshold on these things so these kind of new technologies will actually give us to fix what is the actual threshold how much we can take out a sand and how or how much we can take out water from a natural resource so uh, those kind of stuff needs to be done more intensively because uh, like as a field biologist we are working on in the, future, the perspective yeah. of yeah in the we are actually working on the perspective of the animals but we are not actually working on the perspective of people uh, but i think uh, uh, like uh, people like devyani can people actually and habitats, their, yeah. yeah like people who are working on habitats they can actually say about like what will be the threshold and uh, how we can uh, regularize these kind of uh, activities and how uh, extinct we can do this thing sure thanks jalap then that was a really wonderful talk so uh, now moving on to devyani so i as i mentioned earlier i don't know devyani that well 
still a bit of a mystery to me but in her bio she is very poetically said that her career has meandered through research travel and science communication and while studying geomorphology she has unearthed a passion for rivers and their power to shape landscapes a passion she hopes to convey through her talk at the session so the floor is all yours devyani and it would really be interesting to hear from you about like jay just spoke about a free flowing river like chambal and you know its importance for letting biodiversity flourish because of its habitat condition so it would really be interesting to hear you over to you um so to add to anuja's point um i haven't actually uh, worked on any rivers but i did study geomorphology and part of the charm of geomorphology was looking at how landscapes evolve how they are shaped and who are the agents that actually shape the landscape and rivers in india are um, the most important sculptors of the landscape um, so when we're talking about gharial habitats or we're talking about habitats freshwater habitats on any river uh, perhaps we need to trace the journey of the river and see where the river comes from and what are the different functions that the river performs to be able to create these habitats so if i may um i'm sure this is something that is very familiar to a lot of us but bear with me while i just outline why these processes are important um as i mentioned rivers in tropical countries are the major landscape sculptors while um, rain and wind uh, even ice to certain degrees might be important in shaping some landscapes it's really the rivers that um, have carved a lot of the features that we see around us when we're talking about habitats like the sandbanks for the gharials and i'll qualify that component of sand a little further uh, by saying that there's more to that sand than just sand as we know it right the sand that we make uh, castles out of perhaps on the beach um the process starts with weathering of course um which is an in situ uh, a single location breakdown of the rocks that happens into something called sediment so when we're talking about sand i want you to think about sediment it's a broader concept which includes gravel which would be coarse material angular rocks sometimes even pebbles depending on just how fast the river flows uh then you have sand the familiar um component of beaches but sand is very similar in rivers as well which is largely a uh, breakdown even further of uh, gravel uh, sandstone and finally another component of sediment is silt or clay which is very fine particles that are carried much further down the river than either gravel or sand can be and ideally it is a mixture of these three elements of sediment that's gravel sand and silt that form a lot of the habitats further downstream after material has been weathered broken down disintegrated by a whole bunch of these physical chemical or biological processes uh you have erosion a lot of people tend to use these terms interchangeably something we learned very early on was that weathering happens at a single location whereas erosion is the actual physical transport of material from one place to another and this will happen uh through agents like rivers wind glacial ice sometimes runoff water as well which could be rainwater and finally um after the material has been weathered it has been transported to a particular place if the river doesn't have the power it's slowed down uh, the slope is not enough for it to flow very fast um or it's tired as um more metaphorically um geomorphologists say uh, the river becomes sluggish and drops off or deposits some of this sediment and then that sediment uh forms sandbanks and bars which is the key feature we are interested in right now uh the levees which would perhaps be what uh jay was mentioning when he said they measure the height of these things so levees are these bund or dam like structures that form on either side of a river 
and the alluvial fans or plains that we're very familiar with. Um, I'll take you into that on the next slide. So the river plays out its roles for sediment transport at three different levels. Weathering happens in the high elevation zones where rivers are born in a way where streams merge and form rivers and carry that weathered material downstream. In the high elevation zones, there are greater slopes. So the river can get to greater velocities. It has an immense force and it's able to transport heavier uh, material, uh, sediment, that is more gravel, lots of pebbles, a lot of sand, and a huge amount of silt. And then all of this, it exits the mountains and it flows into the mid uh, channel, which is the plains. So when you look at river systems like the Ganges or the Yamuna, you see that after they exit the mountains, they form these really broad spread out uh, alluvial plains as is, or they're called fans sometimes, where the river suddenly loses its velocity. Uh, it's carrying a lot of sediment and it just spreads out a little and it starts to do what comes naturally to water. So when all of us put on a tap, right? How does the water flow? The water never really gushes out straight. The water forms these sinuous channels. And a lot of times when we're looking at river development, we are not considering a river in those terms. We're not thinking of her as flowing or meandering. We think of it as straight channels of water. But when the river exits from the high elevation zones and enters the mid elevation zones, she starts to swerve, to meander, to form these sinuous channels, which ultimately are important in the habitats that we'll be talking about. Um, and then the river continues uh, further downstream and eventually meets the sea. In the case of the Chambal, this is not so because instead of meeting the sea, the Chambal flows into the Yamuna. It's a tributary that eventually joins with the Yamuna. So in the Chambal, we're interested in these two areas, which is the uh, high elevation zone and the mid elevation zone. Um, why I was so fascinated by the role of rivers is because um, a wise old uh, professor said that the role of rivers in geomorphology is to cut down the ambitions of the mountains to the level of the sea. What geomorphology is looking at is how landscapes reach equilibrium right? Find a balance between the mountains where the rivers can really flow very fast to the sea where the rivers end. And the entire journey of the river is dictated by allowing this flow to go unfettered. Um, so what happens when we block this flow, right? Rivers cannot meander. A lot of times the damming projects happen higher up in the mountains or just after because our damming projects are to do with hydroelectricity power, which means we need the river at their most violent, um, at their fastest, and um, dams are built up river. So the very weathered and eroded material that's supposed to be transported downstream gets blocked in dams. As most of you would know, one of the major problems that dams have is um, siltation. Siltation is nothing but the accumulation of the sediment within the reservoir channel that causes the um, reservoir capacity to be reduced. And every year, um, we spend a massive amount of money desilting dams. And the same silt or sediment is denied to the ecosystems further down river. So why do rivers meander? One, because water naturally flows in a sinuous way. And two, because it's heavy with sediment from the mountains. And then it carries that sediment from the high elevation zones to the lower mid elevation zones. 
And while the river starts meandering, it does two things. The curve, the outer curve of the meander where the river can still flow fast, where it's still unimpeded, it cuts the river banks. It carves the river banks and it forms very distinct landscapes. While it's cutting the river bank, sometimes some vegetation can um, retard that process. On the inner curve of the meander, the river is a little slower and the heavy sediment that it has been carrying from the high elevation zones gets deposited. So all of the habitats that we're talking about in this thing depend on this process, the sandbanks and the sandbars. Another thing we need to remember is that sandbanks are temporary habitats, which means they're constantly shifting. They're in flux, just like the river. Uh, because the river is flowing, the way it deposits the material, it also tends to carry it away further downstream. Now, if for any reason that fresh influx is blocked off with a dam, or once that influx comes in, like Jalab then said, um, sometimes sand is mined, which means that the um, bank needs a particular amount of sand to be stable as a habitat. And if that is being extracted at a rate that's faster than what the river can deliver, from upriver, that's when your habitats get destabilized. And if uh, dam waters are also released very quickly at some point, um, there's massive flooding that happens or the river suddenly picks up speed and it can wash away these sandbanks further down. Uh, that is why having development that takes into consideration the natural flow of the river and tries to figure out where it's headed and how it's headed and what are the processes along the way that need to continue unimpeded, then you have um, the river being able to perform its function. So the function of the river, be it erosion, right? Be it uh, carrying this and forming these habitats midstream, or it could be depositing some of the silt uh, to form fertile grounds for farms along its way. All of this is dependent on the amount of silt, or sorry, the amount of sediment that it can carry. And the amount of sediment that it can carry will depend on how much force or flow that the river can have. Um, taking us back to Chambal, we tend to not to think of rivers as a very massive landscape, but it is. As you can see, the Chambal originates somewhere to the north of the Narmada, and then it flows northwards. Uh, there are four dams that are currently built on the Chambal, and the Gandhi Sagar is among the oldest, after which it flows towards what's today the Gharial Sanctuary, and finally it meets the Yamuna um, in Uttar Pradesh. So it flows through three states before it joins the Yamuna. At this point, what's important to understand is, um, or rather, the Chambal is in geographical terms, something known as an antecedent river. So what does an antecedent river mean? It means that it was a river that was carving its way through the landscape way before a lot of the other landforms originated or a lot of the other landforms were present. So the Chambal, believe it or not, flowed way before the Yamuna and the Ganga coalesced and flowed towards the Bay of Bengal. So it's a really, really old river. And maybe that's why the Chambal found its way into Indian mythology. So I have another uh, suggestion for maybe why the Chambal continues to host biodiversity and the Gharial populations survive here and nowhere else. Um, all of you are familiar with Mahabharat. And in Mahabharat, um, Chambal or Charmanvati, as the river was called back then, was part of Shakuni Mama's territory. Shakuni Mama, as you know, was famously in that dice game, uh, cheated the Pandavas of their rights, of their kingdom, and also of their wife, Draupadi. And it led to her being disrobed in a public seminar at which she was really furious. So sure, she called upon Krishna for uh, help, but after that, she cursed the land of Shakuni. 
And the Chambal being part of that land, she also cursed anyone who would drink from the river at Chambal. So perhaps that's why the development along the Chambal was not religious. Um, the uh, mythology claimed that it was a cursed river and damming projects are definitely more recent than you see elsewhere. Um, so I feel in order to understand the journey of any river and then to kind of prioritize the development needs to look at the sediment. We need to look at exactly how the river needs to flow in order to ensure that there's enough sediment and then the river can meet all of its different functions. So um, interestingly, uh, Jai also mentioned something about the garials at different seasons needing different things from the river. Now, if a river was allowed to naturally flow, her seasonal patterns would ensure that there would be uh, sandbanks when the crocodiles needed to breed. There would be higher sandbanks, I think higher sandbanks for when they needed to breed, uh, enough water flow to ensure a rich supply of fish during the monsoons when the garials he mentioned uh, save up on their reserves and then allowed to dry out a little bit when maybe the gharials are prepared for it and other reptiles. So a lot of the biodiversity on the river channel will also follow similar seasonal patterns. And I think it's important to understand that everything that is tied into the sediment and how much a river is allowed to flow. So that's all from my end. And uh, right. Thanks, Devyali. I think those were some beautiful graphics that you showed us and, and really amazing the way you took us through the natural river processes that are, you know, needed to make those perfect or critical habitat uh, conditions that are needed for the survival of all the, the biodiversity we saw in Jay's slides, the photos, the gharials, the skimmers, all the wintering water birds and the fish, of course. So really, it was really fascinating to hear that. So uh, now moving on to our third speaker, Dr. Abhijit Das. Dr. Abhijit, are you there? Hello. Uh, hi. Abhijit, you... sir? Yeah, hi, sir. Hi, Anuza. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, OK. Nice to see you. So, uh, Abhijit, sir, apart from being my mentor and one of the coolest herpetologists around, is also a faculty at uh, Wildlife Institute of India in Dehradun. Um, he has done his PhD on snakes of Northeast India from Utkal University, Odisha. And uh, he's, his research interests include herpetofaunal systematics and biogeography. And he believes that knowing our species better is a prerequisite for meaningful conservation action. So I think I have been a first-hand witness to this. Uh, you know, often when you're studying reptiles and sometimes like me, a, a subfield of that turtles doesn't feel as glamorous as studying field that way, especially when you're in field, he, he makes sure that everyone understands the importance of even reptiles. And so today it would be really interesting to hear about aquatic reptiles and, and turtles from Abhijit Sir. So uh, Sir Devyani mentioned uh, you know, this importance of these alluvial fans and sandbars as the re river comes down and meanders. So what other better place than the Brahmaputra river system to see the kind of habitat, the pristine habitats? I mean, apart from Chambal, Brahmaputra is on a whole other level. So it will be interesting to hear your take since you've worked so much in the Northeast India. So over to you, sir. Hi, thanks, Anuja. And uh, first of all, let me thank you and uh, uh, Sneha for calling me. And happy World River uh, Day to all of you. And I really, uh, you it's know, on Mota, Sunday, sir. I mean, whatever <laughs> for me it's today, but uh, I, I was like, today? I really feel the value of these rivers because I, I just compared them with our blood vascular systems, uh, like our larger rivers as our as as the vein and arteries 
and those smaller streams are just like our blood capillaries, right? Which is very, very important for life uh, in, in this, uh, in our around. So I just share my screen and if you awesome. just see that, um, I just prepared a small presentation. Can you see this uh, slide? Yeah. 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 So, you can all so go the topic was quite tricky. It was about lesser known aquatic reptiles. But when we talk about reptiles, then most of them are lesser known, right? I mean, if we talk about reptiles, then more than 50% of Indian reptiles are known from less than five records, okay? And almost more than 60% or so species comes in data deficient or not evaluated criteria of IUC and red list. So that's a huge staggering number. And obviously we, we know that to save a species from extinction like that we did for our, our uh, tiger and some of the species that we work on, we know about population, we know about their biology, we know what they eat, what is their ecology, and th all this information helped us to save those species. But when we talk about reptiles or in that way amphibians, then we hardly know anything. So that's the problem in saving those species from extinction, right? So Today, I will try to emphasize mostly on what are those lesser known aquatic reptiles. And this evening, I was like just collecting information about the species that are hardly mostly from the aquatic habitats. So I have just selected some species, uh, for example, the turtles that are most obvious species of our freshwater ecosystem. These are hard shell turtles or soft shell turtles. So we have, you know, really, really diverse assemblage of this hard shell and soft shell species. For example, we have almost like nine species of soft shell turtles. Some of them are even endemic to India. And we have a really, really diverse assemblage of hard shell turtles inhibiting our uh, diverse ecosystem that we will, we will see later. But so the, the animals or especially the turtles that has webbings in their uh, limbs. That's one of the criteria for aquatic reptiles that we have selected here. Then we have a bunch of species of uh, uh, snakes, very interesting species of snake, largely homolopsid snakes, or in common uh, word, they are known as mud snakes. So these snakes, if you carefully see, have a, have a nostril, which is almost located at the top of their head and also an eye, which is located almost on the top of their head. So quite dorsal in position of those uh, very special um, body parts. So they are also shows aquatic adaptations. And we consider this nine species of homolopsin snakes as aquatic species and few other natricin snakes like Xenocropis uh, group, which we also consider. So, together something like you know we have uh, around 10 species plus five uh, which are mostly aquatic snakes okay and then we have some very interesting snakes which are not actually completely aquatic but do, they do show aquatic adaptations for example if you see the nostril opening in those species or those snakes which is a staggering number of almost close to 30 species they have valvular flap, okay? That's the terminology which generally means a skin flap with which they can cover their nostril opening, which is also a very, very interesting criteria for aquatic snakes, okay? So we have something like 28 to 30 species of natricine snakes and that this is the one that we have recently described from a small stream near Mizoram, okay? So they are also so-called aquatic reptiles. So how, what is their number so far? If we see, so that's something like, um, if you can see, there are like 23 species of freshwater turtles. We are not considering marine species in this 
in this uh, study or in this deliberation because we feel that because marine species are large, distribution is very large, they, although there may be less information exist in India, but there are quite a lot of information exists from other countries, which makes not them not a lesser known species. So our lesser known species lives in rivers, streams, land, uh, lakes, swamps, and mangroves, okay? And of these turtles are uh, a lot of species, 23 species, of which I have not considered some species like Melanocheli strikerinata or Vigiatel sylvatica, which are largely terrestrial in their habit. We have some 15 species which are almost completely aquatic species. We have three crocodilians of, in which I have also considered the salty uh, as a mangrove species and included it. But we had this beautiful presentation on Garial and its habitat previously. Uh, and we have a staggering number of 40 odd species which are directly wetland dependent species. For example, most of their distribution in a forester ecosystem, if you go, that will just from a uh, river and from river, something like five meter away along the terrestrial zone. So they are mostly restricted to what we call riparian habitats, which is a completely dependent on aquatic ecosystem. So these are of the, our diversity largely, I mean, broadly the diversity of aquatic reptiles in our country. Now, where they live, I mean, they are in our large river systems, what we saw that the beautiful and the wildest river, Chambal. And there is also some rivers like lesser known rivers though. These are like, this is Girua River of Ketarnia Ghat Wildlife Sanctuary which is at the Nepal border, where there is a small section of this, of this river, some 18 kilometer long stretch is one of the prime gharial habitat, where something like 30 or adult individuals are surviving there. However, those, have, those large rivers, or in that way, for example, our Brahmaputra river system, which is a huge uh, river uh, of our country, we need not to see this large river as one single unit because in those rivers, there are certain habitats. For example, in Girua River, this small island, which was five meter wide and some 20, uh, some uh, 15 meter long, the small mid river island was responsible for whole nesting activity of the Gharial during 2008 to 2010. And, this, and we, in, in one of those high flood season during June, July, because the water was released from Nepal, the whole nesting island was washed away during 2008. And all the 20 nests by gharials of that islands were washed away. So there, although it's a large river, but ultimately the effective habitat size of that large river comes down to this small nesting island as well as this small stretch of 18 kilometer river and stretch, which is under a protected area. So we have to see our uh, river system in much more detail to save our species from extinction, right? We have some other species which are almost gone from outside protected area. These are slow flowing weedy rivers, mainly created due to the change in river course largely by Brahmaputra river system. If you go to Kaziranga, you will see those rivers like Difolu river, where, uh, and these kind of habitats are completely dependent on flood, uh, flood, flood, annual flooding, because every year annual flooding gives them a new lease of life. And these are highly productive landscape with so many species of turtles and also associated fauna. We have a lot of uh, uh, lentic habitats, and especially these beals and marshes. And these are the habitats most, most threatened because they are completely dependent on the just adjoining land, okay? So for example, this Ramsar site just near Gohati, although it has created a lot of PhDs and a lot of uh, projects has been completed, but then hardly there were, uh, there we could do a little about conservation of this great, uh, protected area uh, and it is threatened from the ever increasing Gohati city, right? And the fauna there is completely threatened and it's every day it's declining. 
uh, we also need to know the streams, you know, because the streams are ultimately are the creator of our great rivers. And we have to be careful about conserving our streams because even a small dam can greatly change the geomorphology of those streams. For example, those streams has these pools. Okay, this fast flowing stream has different sections, right? The fast flowing sections called as refill, then the, the water that is like makes a, makes a, a, a ED and makes a pool where water is less uh, flowing. So these are pools, there are refills, there are cascades. So all these different section of the stream may provide different microhabitat for various kind of reptiles and amphibians. So we have to be careful in saving our stream so that we save our species also, uh, uh, you know, specialized to those habitats. So, um, what are those very, very poorly known species? If you talk about, there are few species of lizards, although they are not directly uh, associated with wetlands, but they are always near to wetland. For example, this diminutive uh, water skink, which actually forages inside the shallow streams. Okay, And if you want to find that species, that's very small uh, lizard species, you have to walk on those first order stream and you have to leave the rock in the daytime and they will be hiding under those moist rock, okay? And they will be foraging in the water. And these are so poorly known that, you know, even if they go extinct, nobody will know. And we have no information about this species, how many, whether they are egg layers or life bearers, we do not even know, okay? There are other species Yes, for example, we have recently discovered this, uh, rediscovered rather, it's a Assam killback snake, which we found from upper Assam in evergreen forest, where we have found this, the only known second specimen of the species from a small uh, evergreen forest wetland, okay? So this, the specialized habitat that we have encountered for the snake is the small, slow flowing stream within evergreen forest. So these are very, very specialized habitat living species. And because there are hardly any information available about this species, we call them as covert species. But there are certain species uh, which we know a bit about them. For example, our hard shell turtles or soft shell turtles, but also it's not saving them needs much more information than what we currently know. We know their species diversity, we know the bit of their biology, but we have no information about their population, which is crucial for saving the species. We also have no idea whether the, the long generation time that these species need to get matured, whether we are whether our ecosystems are providing that maturation time for their breeding to commence or they are being harvested or they just get they just get you know killed before they even mature or breed for their first time so even we have no information about their population connectivity or the bottleneck effects which they are facing so which is not enough and so far our this our our information is just limited to their distribution and natural history. So we need to do a lot. And we also need to say that the species that are almost grows as much as weight of a human being, we hardly know about their distribution and abundance. That's uh, That shows that even larger species are also not very well known. Okay, so they are covered species and as well as they are exploited species, which makes them double uh, vulnerable to extinction crisis. So with this, I just summarize what are the species that are most vulnerable to local extinction, the species that has long generation time, the species that are dependent on multiple habitats, for example, reptiles, they are dependent on basking habitats, they are dependent on nesting habitats, they are dependent on wetland habitats, right? The exploited species, for example, turtle, tortoise, or water monitor lizard, they're highly exploited. So one thing is that we don't know much about them. And one thing is that they're exploited at the same time, which is a good recipe for extinction. And to make the matter worse, most of them are taxonomically cryptic species. 
and they are obviously covered species. So which makes even they go extinct from our river system, we'll hardly know about them. Okay. For example, this turtle basking, which is a critical need they require for for basking turtles, they need tranquil habitats, undisturbed habitat. Otherwise, they will come, they will again go jump into water, they will again come back. So they cannot complete their basking. Uh, uh, and that, that will lead to physiological trouble, especially for gravid female. There are certain species of turtles where female is so large and the male is so small. So, and turtles are harvested. So selectively, there is destruction of the breeding population, especially the female, okay? Because larger turtles are only favored when there is a trade involved. So you are actually removing the most important part of a population that is females, okay? So that is a population, population crash that happens very, very drastically, right? And often in aquatic system, impacts are far away from our aquatic ecosystem. For example, maybe our lakes and rivers are safe and we save them, but species do not leave, stay at one place. They have to disperse, they have to migrate. And the impacts may be far away. For example, the railway lines and roads are killing a lot of our species which are migrating or dispersing, especially the gravid female, which must need to migrate during their breeding season, right? So these are certain impacts we need to know far away from our aqu aquatic ecosystem to keep our genetic connectivity intact. So what are the research need that we know, need now? We have to go away from our temple turtle research and distribution findings. We have to now generate information about population data. Okay, we need to know how many species uh, turtles are living in our system. We have to generate information about movement ecology, how far a turtle is moving. Okay, juvenile dispersal, adult migration. Okay, these are crucial info information for long-term survival of population. We have to identify crucial habitats. We may have 25 species of freshwater turtles, but then we hardly have any information where they're laying eggs. We do not know where are those nesting habitats located, okay? And we must need to understand now the gene flow of an ecosystem. We may think that our Brahmaputra because it is, is a very nice river, but that Brahmaputra may be heavily fragmented. Every one kilometer of Brahmaputra river system may carry one huge net, okay? So that creates genetic bottleneck. Our, our system, our rivers are not connected. We must need to know whether there is a free flow of gin or that there is genetic homozygosity that is happening within our aquatic reptile population. So these are priorities in research. And uh, thank you very much. And if you have some question, we can further discuss. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was really a very fascinating talk. And I'm so glad that uh, you have given us a glimpse into these lesser known aquatic reptiles that have really been ignored. And a lot of herpetologists themselves don't have a clue about that these species exist. And there's so much scope to work on you know, freshwater reptiles. So really, thank you for that. Thank so you. I think we're like right on time. We, can, we have about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, sir. So you can hold on. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions coming in for you. So we'll uh, start with some questions for Jayalab then. Jay, are you there? So there are a lot of people that are very interested in knowing about the historic distribution of gharials uh, as compared to muggers one. And was it always such a fragmented distribution? So Jay, maybe if you could answer a bit about that. Okay. Okay, so till Jay comes back, uh, do we have any other questions for Devyani or Dr. Abhijit? Anuja, Ashutosh, uh, Dr. Ashutosh yeah. wants to ask a question for uh, Dr. Abhijit, but he hasn't typed. Yeah, but I can't see a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you just check with Jay if he's there? Yeah, I'll just. 
Oh yeah, he's come back. Yeah. Hi, Jay. Are you there? Should we ask Dr. Ashutosh to unmute and ask his question direct to Dr. Abhijit? Yep, Ashutosh. Anuja, he may not be able to unmute himself if that's the setting. I I have uh, asked him to unmute. Okay. So there is a question by Rohit Jha that maybe if Devyani wants to have a take on. So he talks about river flow, you know, that there are a lot of large dams and barrages that exist upstream. And uh, the river flow in the dry season is severely stressed. So how will this affect large scale processes like gharial persistence? So I know you can't answer the gharial part of it, but do you want to maybe talk a lot also about how sand mining is actually a really, you know, a serious problem that we have that a lot of our rivers are facing right now? So um, to go to the first part of that question, um, why the river flow would affect, I'd mentioned that sandbanks are temporary habitats, which means they depend on the influx of sand and the amount that a river can flow to actually regulate how much of the sand bank um, is available. Uh, so Rohit, if there are a lot of dams further upriver, uh, in any case, the river during the dry season would have lesser flow, uh, which means that uh, there would be more deposition of sand and the sandbanks would get higher and higher. But in case the sand never reaches the lower levels of the river, the mid levels of the river, and you have a blockage happening with the dams, the sand, the sand banks that could have formed through these different seasons are already missing the amount of sand influx that they really need. Um, I think any kind of a habitat that depends on the equilibrium of the processes further upstream will ultimately affect exactly how much um, reptile or any other biodiversity survives. Uh, apart from the gharial populations, those same sandbanks along the Chambal also host a lot of winter biodiversity. Your skimmers, a whole range of migratory birds need stable yeah. sandbanks to be able to um, winter before they kind of fly off further on their migratory routes. So um, along with dams, any kind of sand mining that happens where more sand is mined than can be sustained by the river or can be provided by the upper stretches of the river would mean that then your habitats are just destabilized and most of your things are flowing further mm -hmm. on river. So I hope that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, I think the key is sustainability, but when it comes to sand mining, I think it's a very complex issue. So Jay, if you're here, just quickly take one short question for you. So a lot of people want to know about the historic distribution of gharials as compared to muggers and has the, pop the distribution always been so fragmented even historically? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Anika, can you, yeah, uh, yeah. Can you come again to the question? So a lot of people want to know about the historic distribution of gharials. Firstly, as compared to the mugger distribution, and secondly, has the historic distribution also been as fragmented as what we're seeing right now? Uh, yeah, actually, like uh, muggers, they uh, doesn't really require that kind of for peculiar habitats like gharials. Uh, so they can uh, exist in ponds, rivers, lake, like other crocodilians. So gharials are uh, the only survivors in the whole family, Garvelidae. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that's how the species is different from each other. 
so basically uh, garials need a special habitat where it's a free flow river and uh, it needs sandbars uh, with high altitude for nesting and low sandbars for uh, so it has these different kinds of uh, uh, requirement for their habitat so i think that the basic answer why they have been already fragmented in even in the distribution in the early times also uh, why they are found in only the indian subcontinent yeah. river system uh, because indian subcontinent river system is having this peculiar habitat of free flow uh, 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 like uh, from the mountains of himalayas like indus and ganges and even brahmaputra so uh, i think uh, uh, that's the answer for the question like why they are so different from others Uh, the distribution thanks jay uh, so there's a question for dr abhijit what are the new technologies that are available for data collection on lesser known reptiles okay so that's a nice uh, question anyway uh, you know we we do have some good techniques and uh, you know probably the best technology available for very secretive reptilian life would be uh, radio telemetry however uh, with the invent of very smaller uh, transmitters uh, we can actually go for even the skinks and lizards or even smaller snakes uh, we can either put them interperitoneally that is inside their body or outside like a backpack uh, for a small skink but for species like large soft shell turtles we also can use uh, some of those transmitters which may have additional um, access points for example depth sounder so with that we will know how many what are the depth profile that species is <laughs> using or uh, even satellite transmitter so any every time the turtle is coming out we will get a signal in our mobile phone so these are good techniques and these are you know uh, some something to we have to add but it's also uh, at, uh, when technologies are available but the most important thing now is to go to the forest and find those species because that is what the most basic thing is lacking uh, we are not uh, doing enough field work to collect enough information from our field so that's i feel that and then only we can do a really good research by advanced techniques Yep. So another question, maybe you could take is that uh, why gharial is not found in Brahmaputra river system, though it sustains potential habitat. So I know for a fact that through Aranya, you have actually done surveys for looking at reintroduction of gharial. So do you want to talk a bit about that? Oh yes. Uh, I we really do not have a straight cut answer why there is no population, not a. uh what is called effective population uh, of gharial in uh, in in brahmaputra river system appears to be the most beautiful and wildest river of our country and considering also the associated rivers like barak river system which was also known to have a strong hold of gharial um, almost 70 to 80 years back uh we did a survey of the of the river systems of assam particularly the riverine stretches which are protected and in falls in protected area and we have found that the upper assam stretch where there are a lot of our rivers like subansiri siang and lohit river coming and meeting a huge confluence of large rivers and from where we actually say it's a brahmaputra river that area holds the most uh, best potential for gharial a uh, reintroduction in future where in a, in a place which is close to the bru saikoa national park now so but these are all uh, we have mm-hmm. not found any gharial population there so um, it was not like we have collected those metadata from actual population but we have used surrogacy approach uh, surrogacy approach in ascertaining the you know the potential habitat for gharials and we have found upper assam stretch is better than lower assam stretch where brahmaputra is being like continuously used by a lot of population there so it seems that if you go through literature report 1950 earthquake after that there's the, there is hardly any report of gharial from those systems so we have no straight cut answer about okay. where 
whatever they lost from those figures. Okay. So just to end on a technical note, I can ask one final question to Dr. Abhijit from Rohit Jha, always asking the tough questions that needed to be asked. So his question is at the MOEF level, what steps are being taken to encourage reptile research and conservation only if it's possible to shed some light? Uh, MOEF uh, level... Obviously, I have to say that there are uh, priorities which are less compared to other megafauna like mammals and birds, mm -hmm. but that also probably reflect to the number of researchers uh, working in this field. And uh, we, we have less number of people in our reptile research and amphibian research. We need more and more people. We need more people who uh, can you know, really do nice work and publish their work. And that's how we make an impact uh, at the ministry level. True. Very rightly said. So thank you so much to Jailabdin, Devyani, and Dr. Abhijit for joining us today. It was really, I think the flow was really good. All the three sessions were quite connected. So thanks a lot. And tomorrow at 7.30, we have our day five, uh, Mammals in the Wetland, hosted by Gopa Kumar. So see you all tomorrow. And thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.